Please be seated. I know a lot of you are probably wondering what happened just a while ago. Apparently, Rod Bonham had some kind of a dizzy spell from some previous condition he's got, and so he sat down, and when he did, uh, you know, several people went to his aid, and and Angela Moffat suggested that he go to the emergency room to be checked out, and so that's where the family is gone with him right now. So we're going to entrust him to people that can handle him better than we can, and uh, I do want us to pray about this and know that we'll be checking on him as, as soon as church is over, okay? Father, we, we just lift Rod up to you right now and pray that, uh, that, that you would take care of him, that you would help the doctors and nurses to be able to, to minister him in a way that, uh, that will bless him and his family. And we pray, Father, that everything is okay. We just entrust that to you. We pray your peace over this whole situation. In Jesus' name, amen. And so two men were talking together one day, and one of them challenged the other and said, if you're so religious, I want to hear you recite the Lord's Prayer right now, and if you can do it, I'll give you $10. The guy said, oh, no problem. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. second guy pulled out his wallet, and pulled out a 10, gave it to him, said, man, I didn't think you could do it. How important are the words that we pray? I personally don't think the words that we pray are nearly as important as getting these two questions right. Who is God? And we looked at that in our introductory lesson last week. Who is God? The main purpose of prayer is not to make my life easier, It's not so that I can get my way. It's not so that I can receive some kind of miraculous power. The main purpose of prayer is to know God. And I need God more than anything I can get from God. But the second question that we need to know is who am I? Who are we? Prayer invites us to take off our masks. Prayer invites us to remove our disguises and to present ourselves to one who knows us fully, to a God who already knows. I suggest that it's here that we truly receive the grace of God because I want you to think about it. How can we experience grace at all except in our weaknesses? How can we receive grace at all except in our defects? And so David wrote in Psalm 51 in verse 17, A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. So, how can I assure that I come before God just as I am. How can we assure that we come before him just as we are? I want to give you six things this morning. This is not a formula. This is just an observation. The first one is that we're aware of guilt. As we approach God, we must come with a spirit of confession. But as we do that, let's remember that we approach one who has revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't turn anyone away. And in fact, Jesus drew close to the desperate. And he is a reflection of God. It's painful for us to to strip away our masks, to strip away our disguises. And to allow ourselves to stand in the light of God's truth revealing us as we really are. And so confession simply establishes the proper order of the playing field. It's creator responding to, I mean created, creature responding to creator. 
Now, besides being good theology, confession's just good for the heart. Confession is essential for healthy behavior. And I've discovered, for instance, in marriage that I've had to learn the hard way that you can't just, repressed issues don't just go away. You can't just take issues and sweep them under the rug, even small issues. Because if you sweep small issues under the rug, it's not going to be long before they're not small issues anymore. Amen? When Jesus shed the light of truth on the hearts of the Pharisees, their response was that they wanted to kill him. Why? Because truth hurts. But I can't receive God's healing grace unless I accept God's diagnosis of my brokenness. Because he already knows. I'm the one who must come to terms with my own true self. And so in my favorite psalm, Psalm 139, in verses 23 and 24, the psalmist says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Only as I am exposed to who I truly am can I then go forward in a new way. Secondly, we've got to acknowledge helplessness. The Norwegian theologian by the name of Ole Halsby has said that the heart, it, the heart attitude that God accepts in prayer can be summarized in one word, helplessness. And then he adds, only he who is helpless can truly pray. Now, I've got to be careful as I approach this because it's becoming, it seems like, more and more of a political issue in our country. Uh, as I'm getting ready to talk about us realizing that we are not self-reliant, I am not in any way suggesting governmental form of socialism or anything like that, Okay. This goes far beyond material stuff that I'm getting ready to talk about. It goes to spiritual stuff. It goes to stuff that has to do with relationships and all kinds of other things. So don't pigeonhole me like that because that's not what I intend. I may have totally confused you just now, but I feel like I need to say that up front. Uh, only he who is helpless can truly pray which creates a huge barrier to prayer for many of us because almost from birth we have been raised to be self-reliant. Parents celebrate as their children learn to do things on their own, as they learn to go to the potty and as they learn to dress themselves and as they learn to ride a bike. And sometimes those kids will say, I don't need any help, I can do it myself. And parents have this silent pride when their kids say something like that. As adults, we take pride in paying our own way. We take pride that we don't need any help from anybody about anything. And so when we're faced with challenges, we seek self-help books or do-it-yourself books. And if we're not careful, what we can do is we can slowly seal off our hearts. We can seal off the heart attitude that God desires most. And we fool ourselves as to our true place in the universe. Jesus told his disciples, John 15 and verse 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And do you know what? Even though we would all acknowledge that that's true, there is, this is a plain fact that we, unaware sometimes, conspire against. The truth is I am not self-reliant and neither are you. I rely on electricity to 
light my house and warm my house and cool my house and I rely on farmers and ranchers to feed me? We live in a world culture, in a world society. We, we live in this web of interdependence. Hopefully with God at the very center of it. Well, most parents feel a sadness when their children outgrow dependence. Even though they know that that's natural and they know that it's healthy. But the rules are different with God. You and I never outgrow our dependence upon God. In fact, to the degree that I think that I have outgrown my dependence upon God, I delude myself. And asking for help is really at the very root of prayer. In fact, when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, in Matthew chapter 6, we have what we often call the Lord's Prayer. And you read through that prayer, and what you'll find is that it is a declaration of dependence. And so people sometimes ask, why does the church always appeal to my weaknesses rather than my strengths? Let me give you a few reasons why that's the case. In, in a world that glorifies success and glorifies self-reliance, an admission of weakness can neutralize any pride that we might have. And at the same time, a position of weakness positions us to receive the grace of God. And further, the very weaknesses that drive us to prayer become invitations for God to respond with His compassion and with His power. As Philip Yancey puts it, in the presence of the great physician, my most appropriate contribution may be my wounds. Third, we need to approach him humbly. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5 says, God opposes the proud but gives favor to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I want you to notice the progression in this verse. As we humble ourselves, as we step down, it's then and only then that God can lift us up. By pretending that we're strong, by pretending that we are self-reliant, we may actually be blocking God's power into our lives. Well, Jesus told a parable. It was a parable that he told to draw a sharp contrast between a prayer of superiority, which God rejects, and a prayer of dependency, desperation, which God welcomes. It's found in Luke chapter 18, and you know the story. Luke 18 and verse 9, he says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. And then he concludes by saying, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Our problem is that we confuse humility with a poor self-esteem. When actually true humility is an ongoing decision to give God the credit rather than myself. 
When the New Testament was written, it was written in a culture that was dominated by Roman and Greek influence. And for both Romans and Greeks, the, the, uh, the human trait, the characteristic of humility was considered to be a weakness. It was a character flaw. They admired the values of accomplishment and self-reliance. Hmm. Things haven't changed a whole lot in the last couple of thousand years, have they? Theologian Daniel Hawk says the basic human problem is that everyone believes that there is a God and I am it. And so we need a strong correction in all of that and that's what prayer offers us. It realigns us. And so humility is in approaching God is simply an acknowledgement of truth. It's a reflection of truth. Most of what I am, most of what you are, let's just be downright honest, most of what we are, we have very little influence over. I did not choose to be born an American. What a blessing that is. But I didn't choose it. I was born that way. I didn't choose what gender I am. I didn't choose my race. I didn't choose my body type. I didn't choose the time in which I'm born. I, I, have, some, I have some influence over my health, but not totally. And much less can I control the weather or the spinning of the earth on its axis. You see, there is a God, and I'm not it. And humility means that in the presence of this God, I'm reminded of my true place in the universe, which exposes my smallness, but at the same time reveals his vastness. So number four is this, and this is one that's been most helpful to me in my journey over the last six years, is admit doubts. I'm going to reframe Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44 just a little bit. It's a short, it's one of Jesus' shortest parables. And this is what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Often when we read that parable, and rightly so, we focus on the idea of the treasure. We focus on the idea of the labor that it took to dig it out. But I want to suggest to you this slant on it. Much of what we call faith is obscure. That's why it's called faith. And as I pursue my faith, I do a lot of digging. I'm desperate to find the answers, and so I do a lot of digging. And so I, I, I dig as I try to figure out how can I better explain this mystery to me, the Godhead, the Trinity. And so I, I dig for answers to that. And I dig for answers as to why there is so much human suffering in our world. And, and I, I dig for answers to why does faith have to be so hard even when a person chooses to be a person of faith? Now, does God understand my doubts? TC said yes. I believe God does. And I believe God does because his word includes eloquent expressions of doubt. In fact, I would challenge anyone to find a single argument that's, that atheists and agnostics use against God, like Bertrand Russell and Voltaire and all these others, find one question that they bring against God, and you will already have found it in the Bible. All you got to do is go read Habakkuk, the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, the book of Job, and you're going to find questions Ask like this. It's going to be questions of, of, or it's going to be expressions of hurt and expressions of betrayal. 
I feel like I've been betrayed by you, God. Uh, life doesn't make any sense to me. And God, why do you seem so distant from me when I most need you to be close? And God, do you even care about where I am right now? Those are the kinds of questions you're going to find. And I think important to our discussion, every one of those questions is within the framework of prayer. Prayer allows a place for us to bring our doubts. Prayer allows a place for us to bring our complaints. And here's the thing, though, that happens. Here's the exchange that takes place. We can place those complaints and those doubts in the blinding light of a reality that we may not be able to comprehend at this point, but we can learn to trust the one to whom we come. My doubts are cast in a different light as I get to know the person in whom I can trust. So back to this parable. This man labored hard to find that treasure. He dug for it and he found it. And after he found it, he joyfully went and sold everything he had so that he could purchase that piece of land. And I doubt at that point that he spent much time more time thinking back to all the labor he put into digging. And there's going to come a point in my life where, where the doubts and the questions that I've had, they're not going to matter anymore because I'm going to find the treasure. Fifth, embrace honesty. We humans are made up of three selves. We're made up of the image of ourselves that we project publicly. We're made up of the image of ourselves that we allow other people to see into us a little bit more, close friends, family. But third is the secret places that we never make known. And I would suggest to you this morning that it's that third place that God invites us to open up to Him in prayer. Those places of shame that we tend to put in the closet those expressions of guilt and regret that we bury out of sight, out of mind. Because it's in vain that we try to put barriers up to keep God from being able to see them. God sees into our hearts. I wonder if some of us really believe that. God sees into our hearts. The truth is, what we think and what we feel is as much prayer as what we say. Because God already hears it. That psalm I love, Psalm 139, verse 4, look what it says. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. We're not hiding anything from him. We might think we put stuff back in the closet that he doesn't know about. He already knows it. And here's the thing that some of us have not yet discovered. But when you do, it will rock your world and change your life for the good. As we learn to give voice to those secret places in our lives, as we learn to bring those things out into the light, they lose their power over us. You bring things of darkness into light, they lose their power. So many relationships that we have are going to remain shallow. Most of my relationships that I have, we might talk about the weather and sports and TV and, and movies, but it doesn't get much beyond that. And as a result of that, that relationship's not really going to go anywhere. Relationships go deeper as we trust people with our hearts, as we open up our hearts to them, and in a very similar way, unless I do deeper with God, unless I'm honest about my bitterness, unless I'm honest about my grief and my difficulty in forgiving somebody, until I do that, my relationship with God's not going to go anywhere either. So I can continue to go to church 
and I can continue to sing hymns and I can continue to address, address God in formal prayers like be with all the people hurting everywhere and forgive me of all my many, many sins. But it's not going to lead to intimacy. We must trust God with what he already knows about us. Which leads to number six is we must embrace transparency. When you pray, do you bear the deepest, most hidden part of your heart? Because only when we do that are we going to discover who we truly are. And nothing short of God's light can reveal that to us. In God's light, I see in me a person who's far different from the image that I attempt to put, pull off on other people. Only God knows the selfish motives that often drive me to do some of the things I do. Only God can see the unhealed wounds that I've kept buried that I put out of sight and out of mind. And this self-exposure, it does not come easily. Even knowing God knows it, it doesn't come easily to confess those kinds of things. But somehow, brothers and sisters, in a way that I cannot understand and I cannot fully express, somehow presenting, presenting those intimate details of my life to God brings Him pleasure. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 15 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she's born? Though she may forget, God says, I will not forget you. And then I love this. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. I want you to think about how mothers dote on their infants. Infants that really don't offer much in return. Every sneeze, every smile, every movement of the eyes, they, they're just keyed in, they're locked in on that. And if a human mother responds with that kind of totally absorbing love, how much more does our perfect Father in heaven? Unfortunately, this is where a lot of people get hung up. Because a lot of people don't really believe that God is who he presented to us in Jesus Christ. That he is a God of love. That he is a God of compassion. That he is a God of gentleness. That he's a God of forgiveness. And I realize that my image of God more than anything else is going to determine the degree to which I am honest in prayer. Because I've, if I see him as a tyrant, I'm not going to be willing to open my heart to him. Do I really trust him with my transparent self? We often foolishly try to hide it, while in fact, I think the hiding of it may be what displeases God the most. To us, what we hold back from God is like we're putting up a wall to, for, of self-preservation. To God, those walls we put up are a sign of lack of trust. And so Psalm 103 and verse 10 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we're formed. He remembers that we are dust. Nancy Myers has said, when uh, who... Who one believes God to be is most accurately revealed not in any credo, but in the way one speaks to God when no one else is listening. And so I've been puzzled by Jesus' words in John 6 and verse 8. 
when he says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Because you know what my first response has been to that so often? Then why ask him? If he already knows, then why ask him? But as I've come to understand better this desire of God's to have relationship us like we understand relationships with each other, it makes more sense. Because the more I know someone, the less information I need to communicate with them. Let me give you a couple of examples. When I go to a new doctor, I have to fill out what seems like mountains of paperwork to share with that doctor my medical history. When I go to my regular doctor who is also a family friend, I skip right back, right past that and we immediately get down to what's really the issue at that moment. Because he knows me and I know him. And in a few weeks, Beverly and I are going to be going out to Pepperdine. We go out there every May. And there will be people that we haven't seen since last year at Pepperdine. And those people that we haven't seen since last year, most of the visiting we're going to do is going to be pretty superficial as we're just trying to catch up with each other. But those who I have that are really close to me, that are, that are close friends, we move right past that kind of stuff to the issues that are more important. And that's how it is with God. So in these first two lessons, what I've hoped to do, my goal has been to establish who God is and who we are. And obviously, it's an unequal partnership. Obviously, it's an odd couple alliance. In human relationships, an unequal alliance like that results in the dominant partner throwing his or her weight around and the subordinate partner just being quiet. And yet... In our relationship with God, this all-powerful one of the universe, this all-loving Father who has no reason to feel threatened by us, He invites us into a continuous, honest flow of communication. He invites us to come and lay our burdens down and come to the table of grace and mercy. And he invites us to come just as we are. Which, by the way, the only way that we can come before him is unworthy. And so we're going to sing a couple of songs. Jacob's going to come and lead us in that, that are intended to remind us of how God wants us to come to him. So let's sing. You all can keep your seat if you don't mind. Lay your burdens down. Every care you carry. And come to the table 